Uh, thank you for sharing with us in our time of study. And it is my prayer that you will be strengthened in this time. Um, let's pray to God in heaven how we love you, how we praise you, how we thank you for this time, this privilege, and this opportunity. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Forgive us for our faults and failures, separate us from our sins and shames. We pray that you would give us what we need and be glorified in, glorified in doing so in Jesus' name. For that's the only name that matters. We ask it all. Amen. God bless you. God bless you again. Listen, um, let's get right into this. Last week we talked about how um, Paul, Timothy, and uh, Silas are now on their first missionary journey together. After Paul and Barnabas could not see our eye, they kept on carrying out the mes message upon this mission. The mission is to check on the churches and strengthen these churches that have already been established. And so here we find that Paul is on his way. He already meets a man by a young man by the name of Timothy, whose name means one who honors God. He's uh, a son of a woman who is a Jew, but also his father is a Greek. Yet before um, Paul joins him or takes him with Silas and himself on this missionary journey to Macedonia, the extended land who um, Paul was in the dream or vision and received the call um, to help, to help us in this extended land. And so here Paul gets up, hurries there, and he's there, and he hears a good reputation concerning this young man. And so um, it teaches us that we ought to raise our young men um, in the fear and the reverence and the respect and admonition in, in the Lord. Certainly, as we continue on in the lesson, we find that uh, uh, Paul, before he takes Timothy, he circumcises him because he's getting ready to meet Greeks, those who knew his father. And in order to be able to be reachable, you have to learn how to be relatable. And so this is not a circumcision of the heart, this is the circumcision of the skin. And so what uh, um, Timothy would have to do then in order to be a witness with his wound is publicize the private pain. He was to show his sh and share the scars that he suffered. And in any time we are witnessing to anyone, we cannot witness as if life has been always wonderful, but we have to at times share our weary, weak, uh, our weak and wounds in order to be a witness. And so he circumcised him and they carry out. They're on their way. They um, go by the riverside there for a prayer meeting on the Sabbath, uh, met by a woman by the name of Lydia, who's from Theatra. She's a seller of uh, uh, purple and, and, and possessions, luxury. Um, this woman who is problemed in pain is uh, with possessions, which says and suggests to all of us that you can still have a car, you can still have a house, you can still have family, you can still be married, you st still have all the things that you really want in life and still have some pains and problems. But it's at a prayer meeting. It's at a prayer meeting, my brothers and my sisters, where she hears and um, experiences the power of God. Uh, God touches her heart, opens her heart, and as Paul is preaching, even at a prayer meeting, the power of the Lord touches her, opens her up so that she can receive but also respond. As a result of her um, receiving the word of God, she's now responding to it in that she tells uh, um, Timothy, I mean Paul rather, don't leave. If you count me faithful, this is what I want you to do. After God has opened up my heart, I'm opening up my home. I want you to stay. I'm begging that you would stay. Help here is when help is being helped. Um, Paul answers the call to Macedonia, the extended land, to help, but in return is being helped. When you just go, God will take care of you and give you what you need. When you just go, 
God will give you what you need. When you're on assignment, he will make accommodations. When you are on your way to do what his will is, he will work things out for you. And so we see how God has blessed them and um, allowed them to have somewhere to stay. So it is in verse 16 where our lesson picks up and it came to pass as we went out as we went to prayer, this is the second time they have gone into prayer uh, in this chapter. It's prayer, 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 prayer. Here at this prayer meeting, a certain damsel, a little girl who was possessed with the spirit of divination. This is a serpent goddess. It is a picture of a snake, a python. But this spirit of divination uh, deals with fortune telling. And so what happens is she comes to a place of prayer meeting. And a certain damsel, this little girl who's possessed, who is uh, fortune telling, who is um, uh, trying to tell folks future, Miss Cleo, probably a cousin or kinfolk um, with some type of connection with her which brought her master much gain by soothsaying. Here, here is at a prayer meeting. Here, here, here Paul speaks of um, a prayer meeting where this little girl shows up. She's possessed and she's present at the prayer meeting. And here it teaches us that uh, the scripture says in verse 16, this girl with the spirit of divination who was possessed is present and met us at prayer meeting. Here it is. You can show up for prayer, but it does not mean you're not possessed. Some of us are possessed with different types of spirits, different types of spirits, spirit of drama, spirit of difficulty, spirit of trouble, spirit of trial, spirit of this and spirit of that. We can all show up to prayer meeting possess. But here is where it gets deeper, it, is, it says in verse 16 that this little girl who was possessed brought her master much money. Here it is. It's not a problem to have a master, but it's the problem of who is your master. Here, it is a little girl who has a master that brings her money, but here is uh, Paul serving his master that's carrying out his message. And so here, these two masters are colliding in a sense using what they are um, the spirit the woman with the little girl with the spirit of divination and paul who has the spirit of the holy ghost look at what else happens in this passage the same follow paul and us timothy and Sil silas and cried saying these men are the servants of the most high god which show unto us the way of salvation. Check this out. This woman or this little girl with the spirit of divination who is possessed, she identifies Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Here it is. Spirits know who you are. Spirits know who you represent. And here's what she says with this spirit. This spirit starts shouting and saying as they're following these followers of Christ, she starts saying, these men are servants of the Most High God which show unto us the way of salvation. Here it is. The spirit is shouting, but the spirit is shouting with the wrong spirit. The little girl is shouting and sharing the truth, but here it is. She's shouting with the wrong spirit. Be careful when you show up and lift up your hands and praise God and fall out, pass out and do all this. You ought to be careful of the spirit that you have when you shout. When you say whatever you say. And it looks like in verse 18, this has been done for many days. It wasn't just one day, but it was at least a couple of days. And Paul, being grieved, he's now greatly annoyed and agitated. He finally turns to the spirit. He, he's not necessarily speaking to the little girl, but he speaks to the spirit. 
But when he speaks to the Spirit, he speaks in a command, but also he speaks in his name. He speaks and he says, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. Whatever spirit that you have and whatever setting that you are in or situation that you're in, I command the spirit that is not of the Lord Jesus Christ to come out of you. Spirit of gossip, the spirit of triflingness, the spirit of backbiting, the spirit of lying, the spirit of, of, of all these things. I command it, he says, to come out of you in the name of Jesus Christ. He uses the name of Jesus, for that is the only name that matters. There is none other name whereby we must be saved. And he came, the Spirit came out in that same hour. Look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. It was the need of the little girl the need to be delivered that became a nuisance for Paul. It was not necessarily that she was having a spirit, divination spirit that was not the Holy Ghost, but it was the side effect. There, was, there are spirits that make you want to or make you do things. Um, spirit of jealousy, spirit of envy, spirit of bitterness, spirit of anger, spirit of, of all these other things. It has side effects. But in the name of Jesus Christ, every dilemma, every, like this damsel who is dealing with this spirit of divination can be delivered. It's only in his name. Her need is met through his name. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains, the hope of their profit, the hope of their money was gone, they caught Paul and Silas. They drew them, they dragged them into the marketplace unto the authorities. And as they brought them to the magistrates, saying, these men being Jews, Doing exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs. Here it is. Don't forget this. Uh, Timothy and Paul are Jews. The mission was to go to Gentiles, share the gospel so that they can be saved. So Macedonia, Philippi, it is a Gentile place and they show up with new teaching and they show up with the teaching and it's troubling them because here it is, not everyone wants to see, wants to celebrate, wants to get excited, wants to be encouraged, wants to uh, 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 praise God for your deliverance. There are so many people that look and are used to seeing you a certain way, used to seeing you bitter, used to hearing you complain, used to hearing you grumble, used to hearing you mumble, used to you having mood swings, used to you being moody, you used to being mean, used to you in your downness that to the point that they they can't accept you being any different, and so. They have difficulty with the deliverance because they relied on the girl being filled with such a spirit. There are certain friends that can call you. There are certain family members, acquaintances that can call you because the spirit that they have has some type of connection and affiliation with the spirit that you have. The reason why you can't get rid of some people, the reason why you attract some people, the reason why you're able to do things with certain people is because of the spirit that you possess or the spirit that is possessing you. And so the reason why you can talk about certain people or gossip or the reason why you can um, do certain things that you do and be okay about it is simply because of the spirit. They like what y'all do and they rather you not be delivered from it. But still, 
struggle in it. So, what he says, they trouble our city, they teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. Here it is, they're saying it's a cultural uh, crash and clash. So in verse 22, and the multitude rose up together against them, them being Paul and Silas, and the magistrates tore off their clothes, commanded to beat them, and then after they suffered many stripes, they threw them in prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Continue reading in verse 24. The jailer who had received such a charge threw them not just in prison, but in the inner prison. They were deep down in chains and bonds. Their feet were fastened in stocks. They could not go anywhere. They're on a mission in Macedonia, and in the midst of a mission, they find themselves in a messy situation. They've been doing what the, the Lord told them to do. They've been preaching even to the possessed little girl. And here, as they are coming to this extended land to help, they are now finding themselves in a hardship and in need of help themselves. And so, in verse 25, we continue to see at midnight. Somewhere, we don't know exactly what time prayer meeting was, but after they come from prayer meeting and see the power of the Lord dealing with this possessed girl, they have some problems that wound up them up in prison. But at midnight, the darkest hour before dawn, at midnight, the coldest, at midnight, when you cannot see your way at midnight. Look at what these men do at midnight. They were on a mission to Macedonia to carry out a message. Now they find themselves in a mess. But at midnight, we see that the scripture says Paul and Silas, number one, prayed and then praised. They prayed and then praised. Here it is. When it's sun shining, can you still pray and praise? But also when it's not going your way, when the storm comes or when it's at midnight in your life, can you still have that same attitude? Can you still have that same spirit when darkness is all around, when the rain is pouring down? Can you still have that same spirit of praise and prayer when they lay you off your job, when you don't know when your next meal is coming from, when you cannot find or figure your way out, when it's always another problem that's coming more than a solution. Can you still have the same spirit to have prayer and praise? Can you still pray and praise when the doctor shakes his head and says, I've done all I can do? Can you still have that same spirit spirit of prayer and praise when folks walk out on you? Can you still have that same spirit of praise and prayer when you have what you think, think, when you don't have what you think you ought to have? Can you still have that same spirit of praise and prayer when you find yourself struggling, suffering, and straining trying to survive? Can you still find yourself praying and praising with that same spirit when you are hard and when you are battered, when you are broken, when you are bruised, when you are burdened, when you have hardships, when you have hurts, can you still, still have that same spirit of prayer, communication, and connection, but also praise, celebration, when you find yourself in a challenge and a circumstance that you possibly Possibly cannot see your way out. Can you still, in your midnight, still pray, talk to God? Can you still 
lift him up and praise him. They prayed and they praised in their problem in prison. And here, the text says the prisoners heard them. Here it is. What do others hear from you while you're in your hardship? What can other people hear when you have problems that are going on? What, what do they hear from your mouth? Do they hear you still praying or, and do they hear you still praising? Here it is. Obviously, although that they were in a hardship, they still found themselves having a hallelujah time in a hard place. And, watch this, it was not private, their prayer or their praise was not private, but it became public. That it was not just noise, but it was something that others noticed. Verse 26, and suddenly, after speaking to God, after singing unto him, suddenly, after God receives your prayer and praise, I believe, my brothers and sisters, while when you pray and praise in your problem, God will provide. It's not how you treat God and talk to God when everything's good. But learn how to treat God and talk to God as if everything's good while you're going through. He says, and suddenly there was a great earthquake. Here it is. God sends things into our situations to shake our situations up. Don't miss it. These men, these clergy, are in chains. They're not only in chains, they're locked down. They're shackled in their situation. They're burdened by their bonds. And yet, in the midst of it all, they still carry out the same spirit and suddenly, all of a sudden, God reacts and responds based on what he receives. He sends an earthquake. The earthquake is there not to destroy them, but to deliver them. He shakes things up so much so that the foundation of the prison was shaken. Immediately, the doors were open and didn't need a key. And everyone's bounds who was in the prison was loose. Here it is. Notice in this prison-like problem, Paul and Silas are not the only one in the problem, but they may be the only one praising God in the midst of the problem. But with that being said, while they're praying and praising in the midst of all other prisoners, watch this, God sends a earthquake not to destroy but to deliver. Here it is. Can people get deliverance because they're in a problem with you? Because of how you still pray and praise God in the midst of it. It reminds me of Jonah. When Jonah was on the ship and it was the opposite with Jonah. Jonah bought the ticket trying to go away from God's call. And what happens, the storm comes and everybody represents or speaks and prays to a one God, but everyone on the ship, when the storm comes, they told Jonah, pray to your God on our behalf. And what happens, the text says that the reason why the storm came was because Jonah was running from God. And reality is, here it is. You can be the reason why things get worse around you, but you can also be the reason why things get better around you. It's when you have the, the servant, the same spirit, even in your situation, even while you're going through, you got to learn how to pray and praise your way through. Look what happens in verse 27. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, 
He drew his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. Watch this. The prisoner, the prison keeper, the, the soldier that is supposed to be standing, making sure the prisoners are safe, was now a sleeping soldier, a sleeping keeper. And he goes from, watch this, someone who's supposed to be trusted, someone who has a charge to um, be the soldier, to be the one who's securing, but then he's sleeping, but now he's becoming suicidal. He goes from now being someone, again, securing these people, now he's sleeping on the job and he wakes up to the thinking that everyone had gone because the door was open and didn't even need a key. And now he becomes suicidal. Threatens to kill himself. Suicidal. Oftentimes when we see others being delivered. We don't deal with it well. And oftentimes it seems as if that God has forget, forgotten about us. And we come to become suicidal. In the midst of this soldier, this prison keeper, prisoner keeper, Paul then speaks. Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, don't harm yourself. We're all here. Here, he becomes suicidal because he did not want to let down and be let down in the midst of their lockdown. And so what happens, he thinks that all the prisoners are gone. And he says, I'm going to kill myself. And then he could not hear, apparently, because, uh, could not see, rather, apparently, because Paul immediately raises his voice and says, don't harm yourself, we're all accounted for. Then the soldier called for light and sprang into the prison. He came trembling, he was once standing, sleeping, and now he's coming trembling, falling down before Paul and Silas, and he asks, he brings them out, in verse 30, and said, sirs, here's this question. What must I do to be saved? What, what, what do I have to do to experience deliverance? What, what, what do I have to do? What, what is it that I have to do? I, I heard y'all singing like the sun was shining and y'all were in a dark place. I, I heard y'all shouting in there and yet it, 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 it's a situation you're in, and, what, and now, all of a sudden, you're able to get out of here. And what, what do I have to do to be saved? Here's the answer. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, watch this, and thy house. It is not the first time that a household has been saved in this passage. First of all, we see three things that God does. He opens up hearts. He opens up minds with the damsel. But then he opens up doors with the prison. But with this house being saved, it's like Lydia. Lydia did not just get saved after her heart was opened, but her whole household was saved. Could that be the reason why she offered them to come and stay with her because the household, what, whoever was in the household became saved? And now here is this man, the little girl, she's already gone back to her home. She's, she's not walking the streets anymore. She's not trying to live on her own anymore. She's not trying to grow up too fast anymore. She's not uh, uh, acting out of control anymore because she has been separated from that spirit by the name of Jesus Christ. And now here's another household that has been affected by the salvation in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
thou shalt be saved in thy house. Look at what he says in verse 32. And they spake unto him, here it is, the word of the Lord. And to all that were in his house, look what happens. Verse 33. And he took them the same hour of the night. After witnessing all of the works of the Lord Jesus Christ, he took them the same hour of the night, washed their wounds, their stripes, their scars, washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straight way. And when he had brought them into his house, he set me, made a meal for them and rejoiced Believing in God with all the house. Here it is. It is not good enough for you to be saved when God is trying to save your own house. It's, it's wonderful that you're saved, but God wants your own house, your whole household saved. And so look at what happens in verse 32. And when it was day, because it was midnight, when it was day, the magistrates sent the surgeons saying, let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told this, saying to Paul, the magistrates have sent, uh, sent to let you go. Now, therefore, depart and go in peace. But Paul said unto them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned. They, they unjustly attacked us. They unjustly beaten us. They unjustly took action upon us, being Romans, and have cast us into prison. And now do they thrust us out privately, nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. It's almost as Paul, again, he still, when Paul got saved, he, he didn't, his personality didn't change, but the person. He, he still had that same personality, but now it's for the Lord. It's almost as if he's picking a fight. He, they said, you can go in peace, but bruh, you literally put us in the middle of the city beat us down publicly, humiliated us, you hurt us, you beat us down, you, you bruised us, you whipped us, you, we took a beating and, and you thought it was funny and now you want to privately just let us go? He says, no, let them come themselves. And the surgeons told these words unto the magistrates, and they feared, and when they heard that they were Romans, they came and besought them and brought them out and desired them to depart out of the city. Here, they're Romans, they're Jews, not just Gentiles, they're Jews. He says, check this out. We have a right to have some respect. That is our right beyond the culture and the differences. We have a right. And as a result, they came themselves, allowed them to go out, the, out of the city, not privately as they first planned, but publicly. And verse 40, this concludes our lesson. They went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they confirmed they comforted them and departed. Here, they returned back to Lydia's house, the first person that they helped after receiving help. They go back, and when they come to Lydia's house, here it is, they receive comfort. After going through challenges and circumstances, after being crushed and crying and after being treated unjustly and fairly, it is only right, after we go through what we go through on a day-to-day -day basis with difficulty and different dilemmas, after we have to tolerate and put up with so much stuff, 
they go back being comforted. When you get a chance to learn how to comfort one another. Paul later on talks about that. Second Corinthians chapter number one. Blessed be the God who comforts us in all of our tribulations that we may comfort somebody else. That word tribulation in that passage means crushing. Thank God that his Holy Spirit paraclete comes alongside us, comes to where we are to comfort us, to give us a lift even in our low places. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. And if you have the Holy Spirit, you ought to be able to help someone. Help the help by comforting them because you don't know what challenges and circumstances that they had to come across. And in order for them to get back to Lydia's house, who they first went to, they return and be comforted. God bless you and God keep you. Thank you again for sharing with us in this chapter of chapter 16 of the book of Acts. Next week we will continue on in Acts chapter 17. Don't forget to continue to pray with us on this Wednesday um, at 6.30 where our, our ladies will give leadership. But don't forget at 5.30 our nurses, choir, and ushers will be meeting on our Zoom conference. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Let's pray out. Dear God in heaven, how we love you, how we praise you, how we thank you for all that you do and done. We pray that you will continue to deal with us and, and deliver as only as you can. We thank you for blessing us, being with us, and breathing upon us. Have thine own way. Thank you for answering, allowing us to answer the call and help us to be committed um, to the call that we may be comforted. Because as we seek to help, at times we're going to be in hardships where we need help ourselves. But thanks be unto you, who is a very present help in the time of trouble. Thank you for hearing us, helping us, handling us, and holding us. Have thine own way. Be glorified in Jesus' name, for that's the only name that matters. We ask it all. The people of God who agreed said amen. God bless you. God loves you. And so do I. Thank you.